I think we're going to start. It's, it's a big honor for me to uh, introduce Tony Fretton, who ha opened his office in 18, uh, 1982, and um, and I think uh, has has always worked in a very uh, careful and uh, sensitive way. And um, um, I first encountered his work in uh, a building in London called the Listen Gallery, which was perhaps the first kind of important building of his career uh, that was finished in, I think, 1992, but designed earlier. And um, he has since then uh, uh, worked both in the UK, but also a lot in uh, Europe, that is to say in uh, uh, Belgium, in uh, the Netherlands and in Denmark, and also in, in Warsaw, in fact, because one of the uh, larger buildings of his practice is the British Embassy in Warsaw, uh, which I think was won in competition, but I'm not sure about that. And, and um, there is a kind of uh, particular moment in his life, I think, which is at, at the beginning of the 21st century, because he is uh, he's invited to uh, um, become a professor in the Teu in Delft in 1999, and uh, and then his uh, uh, the focus of his interest shifts much more towards the Netherlands and to uh, Denmark and to Belgium, and and I think uh, you know what he has achieved uh, is um, extremely uh, sensitive and uh, rich and. Uh, um, pertinent to this present moment with regard to trying to determine an approach to architecture which is both socially responsible and uh, uh, plays close attention to tradition and to, um, and to a reinterpretation of tradition. So without any more ado, I will give the, uh, the mic to Tony Friend. Welcome to the Wood Auditorium, which isn't made of wood, to my consternation. And um, let me see if I can work the technology, which I never do. Um, the best thing is for me to just describe the projects, and then you'll see, I hope, the relationship between form making and elements of architectural knowledge. So we begin with the art museum in Denmark in a place called Fulsang, which means <clears throat> bird song in Danish, and it's a, a building for a permanent collection that they had of paintings from uh, the 1770s to 1970 in all of the European styles. So it wasn't an astounding collection, but it was very meaningful for the local people because um, some of the work in the collection depicts this area, which is a place of um, exceptional beauty. And it's a long way from anywhere. It's two and a half hours south of um, Copenhagen, and you go across flat landscapes, and then, uh, like this, endlessly, and then arrive in um, the space between those two buildings you see ahead of you. And in fact, if you're in a in a farmyard. It's a farmyard, um, a working farm. Um, so you can see on one side, uh, on your left, there's a, an agricultural barn. On the right is a land steward's house. And then across from them is a manor house, which um, is country classical. And it has um, a tradition of um, art events that composer Carl Nielsen um, had a residency there. So it's a curious thing, really. I mean, it has this long history of culture, and yet it's very remote. And the building that we made was um, part of an enterprise by um, the Danish government in combination with a charity called Real Dania to capitalize on the fact that in that region there were um, uh, uh, holiday makers, people who had holiday homes, both from Germany and from Denmark. 
and yet the area itself was in recession. It was originally a sugar-making place. So it was a clever move, really, to give some kind of focus which would uh, give pride to the local people and bring other people forward who are in the area. But And so that manor house is very captivating. It's not brilliantly good classical, it's country classical, and each of the ceilings in each room is slightly different, all of the floors are slightly different, and there's a, a charm to it, and that charm was something that I wanted to have in the building that we designed, it, albeit making a building which is rather more abstract than this. So when we got the composition brief, the brief itself suggested very strongly that um, the, uh, the new building be placed here to um, enclose the courtyard in replacement of a, a building that had burned down. But we, we made another decision. We decided that that view of the land was so uh, good, so beautiful, as I'll show, that we put the building in a different place. We put the building in a line, in a line with the, um, uh, yeah, excuse me, in a line with um, this building here. And what that did is it opened up the view to the countryside. So as you arrive on that route that I described, you, the first thing you see is this very, very flat landscape, agricultural landscape, which goes out to the sea through a, a nature reserve. And that's all artificial. It's been created by um, decades, well, centuries of uh, anonymous work agricultural work and so that's the first thing that we wanted you to see and then it meant the building was to one side and it's a landscape that changes in the seasons so here it is in the snow and when you approach the building that this part steps out and so you're given the view and then you're, it's taken away and then inside the building you find a cafe and then at the back of that cafe is a, a room for uh, teaching of art and public events. And the back of that room is a view of an orchard. So the view is given and taken away and then given back in a different form. And that's become a motive. And it was an unconscious motive in the building, but it's what situates it in the, the territory. And I should say that one thing that's very important to me which I hope you'll see in all of the projects, is that, that what I aim to do through the buildings that I make is to is understand qualities, civic qualities, or collective qualities in the surrounding landscape and make them visible in the buildings that I do. So when you've left the cafe and you enter the, the um, array of galleries, you are in a central gallery which has a view of the land that you first saw when you come in and then you turn and go into what's a temporary gallery. You can see the entrance on the left and then that gallery has, it has a gridded ceiling and above it are roof lights which can be altered um, from full daylight to dark. So at one end, as you can see here, you can have a, a dark end and then you can have a light end. So it's very, it's very flexible and very open to interpretation. And at the other end of that range are a different set of galleries with different daylights for a specific part of the collection. And it was very clear that the um, collection would be disposed in a particular way and we could design for it. Now that said, a lot of these walls are um, capable of being moved, not all of them, because when we started, we originally had planned a a columnar structure so that it could be completely altered in the future, which is what you find museums are. Um, but the Danish construction is is um, precast, precast walls. So we were able to make a series of discrete spaces. Within them, there are movable walls. And then further along, coming back off that corridor, there's another type of rooms, much smaller, six meters square, arranged en filade. And therefore, these smaller scale paintings, these are paintings from the Danish Golden Age, 
and they have a golden ceiling and a decorated ceiling. And the figure that you can see here is one of the light shafts that, uh, of which there are three on the main facade. And it brings light into the floor of the space while not lighting the walls. And this is, I mean, it's a trick. It means that you can light the, the paintings to 50 larks. And yet the, the light in the room changes. So you have an illusion that somehow it's fully daylit. And at the end of that array is um, a room for um, plaster casts, which not being light sensitive can have a window to the surroundings. And then coming out back into the corridor, you find a room at the end, which is just for looking at the landscape. Now I need to say that this um, uh, provision of this room and other rooms in the um, program were the, the desire of the client. And the client group took a year writing their brief and in writing that brief, they were aided by a local architect who um, uh, made schemes based on their brief to show them the consequences of what they were thinking. So they modified their brief according to what the outcome would be. And one of their desires was this room, a room that would, be, would never have any art in it. It would be a moment where, having been in these top-lit spaces, you rediscovered who you were and where you were. And so that room sits in the landscape. And in a way, what I'm hoping is that it lets those people who come to see the gallery understand, perhaps in a muted way, but in some kind of way, that the, the land around it is a cultural artifact. The paintings are also cultural artifacts. So it's an aim, in its aim is to connect the territory in which these people have worked or their forebears have worked, the paintings which are painted about the area and which are a source of natural pride, but also to show the breadth of human endeavor. It doesn't just consist in paintings which are special, it consists in many things which are made by people. And one final few things to say is that, that this building is abstract from this point of view. And, but what, we, what I understand is that we associate abstraction with the modern movement. But actually, of course, it's always existed. It existed in um, vernacular buildings, which are made and remade and slightly altered and made more and more economical. And so this is... Um, a connection that's particularly important to me. And then at certain moments, the building, this building element here talks to that building. And this is something that you'll see throughout the projects, how there will be um, quite human perceptual con uh, comparisons and connections between things in the landscape around the buildings. Now, this is a completely different project. It's in London, it's a house, it's urban. Um, and it's an attempt to make a grand house at the European level, like the Maison Stockley or something like that. Um, and yet, it's an attempt to be both individual and contextual, and its contextuality is very simply achieved. This building line here is in front of that one, so the facade aligns with that, and then this back aligns with that. So I'm really interested in the simplest and most rudimentary forms of urban design, and of course the building um, parapet to line. So it's a, a building which is itself uh, unusual, different from the rest, and yet plays its part in the fabric of the street. Um, let's look inside. Um, then you come in, and there's a staircase which is a classical staircase, a staircase that would be recognizable from a Palladio building. It's a um, self-supporting stone staircase. And throughout the house, there are buildings that I've seen for a long period of time that I wanted to work with 
and I make a proposition that this is a building of modernism, even though it uses reminiscence. And the argument I make is that if you look outside uh, architecture in modernism, painting, literature, and music in the early period of modern modernism quite freely used motifs from the past in com combination with the new possibilities of their time. So, for example, Stravinsky's uh, Rite of Spring contains uh, primitive Russian motifs. Um, James Joyce's Ulysses uses the Ulysses myth as a structure and then applies um, vernacular language to it and Picasso repaints Velasquez and it seems to me entirely justifiable to do this without slipping into the irony and um, pain of postmodernism. And when you come in, uh, you first of all you you come in through a small courtyard which is outside that door and then you come forward and you come into a room at the back which is like this. So the transition between um, the city and your private domain is quite sudden and dramatic, intentionally dramatic. Coming home is a delight, you know. And in fact, a lot of what I do in buildings is to look for pleasure, which is a kind of rare commodity in most architecture. A lot of the sharper architects will um, deal with pain. I'll have no truck with that. So you come into this building and then at the back there's a dining room which projects into the garden um, so that you could have, um, well you you could have a party in there and then go up to the main room above which I'll show in a second um, and so it's delicious um, and along here is a balcony which you see here um, to the main room on the floor above and from that balcony is a informal staircase that brings you down into the garden. So the gesture is a scale. Do you know the staircase has a scale which is at the scale of the garden? And then on that main floor is this room, which is, um, I'll have to do it in feet and inches. Uh, this is going to take some work. 20 foot by 39 foot by 20 foot high, um, approximately. And um, it's, uh, at the scale of uh, uh, the piano nobile of a small piazza, which means uh, palazzo, so it's um, it's comfortable. It's, it has scale, but it's comfortable, and it's for the collection of paintings of the owner, who's a, a collector, a collector of some substance. And the ceiling conceals the lighting, and it has some um, folds in it to do that, so that you don't have an array of uh, electric light lighting your painting and then at the front is this bay window which you may have noticed from the facade which turns out to be a place where the owner can work and one thing about fenestrated buildings as opposed to buildings which have got lots of glass is that you can if you stand in the window you can be part of the neighborhood if you step back you can observe the neighborhood and also windows and doors are not innocent, you know, they were invented millennia ago. And again, just like the abstract vernacular buildings I described earlier, they're changed slightly all the time. So they have, uh, if you want to see it, they have fantastic power as of iconography and association. And then on the top floor is um, uh, the bedroom. And this is, I'm only gonna show part of this. This is the bathroom. Um, here and a courtyard on the roof. The, that bathroom's over there, so you can um, you can come from the bedroom and not have to see any architecture. You know the architect is lost in the planting, so it's a dream space. You know you come from dreaming, and the architecture doesn't destroy your dreams, but in a way the city does something to your dreams because. That's what you see. So in the same way as when you come in, you leave the city behind you. Up here, you have this pleasure of being in your own space and observing the city. And as Kenneth said, we, we made the 
British Embassy in Warsaw, but in fact it was two projects, and this is the first project which um, regrettably wasn't implemented because in the middle of it there was an attack on the, war the um, uh, Istanbul Embassy and um, all projects were put on hold and then by the time it came back policy had changed and in fact we realised on another site we realised only the Chancellery which is the Chancellery in embassies, that's the working building. And in this project what was interesting was there was an ambassador's house, a Chancellery and then an existing building, which was the embassy of, the, um, of uh, Sweden. And so together they made a terrific um, project because they, these three buildings created a courtyard around here and they looked across to each other, and as did this. So um, the courtyard would have been amazing. And also an ambassador's house is quite something. It's quite formal. You know, there's an array of rooms which are disposed in a certain kind of way where an ambassador can walk between um, furniture groups and communicate with people. And then there's a dining room which has to be intimate for six people and 30 people. So it's an amazing project. In fact, we won this because the um, Foreign Office had seen the Red House and thought it looked like an ambassador's house. How they, this is how these things work. And so we, in a the direct way, what I wanted to do is I wanted to use um, uh, very effective typologies. So an English country, an English, uh, an English um, townhouse, an office building. Why an office building? Well, office buildings have got a long history. If you start from um, uh, Florence, the Uffizi, which we now see as a gallery, in fact, was an office building. So there's that long history of office buildings stretching from um, the Uffizi through to the Seagram building. And for me, this was a really interesting typology. Just like a door or a window, it was something that was full of um, creative effort through gentle modification. So we had these two contrasting um, forms. and. Um, they also, and we won this because the net to gross in the embassy was fantastically good. You, it's, it's interesting how you, you win projects. It's not, you don't win them from talent, you win them for the strangest reasons. But on the reverse side, um, the ambassador had a private garden. The ambassadors get heartily sick of being um, ambassadors and want to wear jeans and play basketball and be normal people, and that's what they do at the back of the house. Um, and, but what, what's interesting now is that with the after effect of the Iraq war, which Britain entered with America, all um, embassies, including the American embassy in Holland and uh, London, have become defensive. You know, they have to be defended. So what would the message be? Should it be that it's a defensive building? And there have been a number of embassies made which are like that, with tiny windows, solid walls. But that's the wrong message because embassies have always been a part of cities. They've been a part of the culture of cities, open to cities, holding events. And so the message here, we hope, was of um, warmth and conviviality and the facade would be as I'll show in the realized project, would have um, deep security. And I'll show you how we did that. But we didn't realize this project. But if you're making a project, that, project like this, which you've never done before, you think very hard about what it's like. And in fact, it's true to say that all of the projects we made, whether they be an art gallery or a museum, they're always the first ones that we've ever done. So we've never had any experience in anything. Everything turns out to be original. So. You have to think very hard, and you draw in curious ways, like you think about the, how the facade could be slightly adjusted of the ambassador's house, what the corner would be like, no ornament, maybe a flag, um, what's the window detail like? And then what's the relationship between the two buildings? And then we, by some curious, Miracle, we were asked by a, an Italian publishing company 
to make a book on our work. And we, um, I chose to make a book about designing the Warsaw Embassy, and a book specifically for students of architecture to show how messy design is, how uh, avenues are pursued and don't work out and then are replaced with other things. And I'm not explaining this fully because I can't in the time that we have, but it's to show students that, that it doesn't come directly. You have to keep designing. You have to design and redesign. And then when you've got what you think is a final design, then um, building control issues come in and change it, and you have to absorb that. So it's a, que a question of gradually coming from a concept to one that's workable, and then finding out how that can support the things it needs to do as a real building. And that's actually what we did build. We built this on another site without a residence. And one thing about uh, Poland is that the climate is very cold in winter, very hot in summer, and inevitably, unavoidably, this building had to face south. So what we did is we made a double facade, and that double facade is, I mean, it's very crude. It's a climate facade. You open it top and bottom in the summer, and it exhausts the heat. The winter, you close it, and it's um, highly thermally insulative, and all of the glare is start with, with blinds on the inside, which are much easier to manage, because embassies don't maintain themselves properly. Governments don't maintain their embassies. So we did something that was very rudimentary. But what it got us was a facade which on the outside, I'll just go back, reflects the world, reflects the sky, reflects the trees. It's worldly in a good sense. And then inside it is a building which where you could point a nine millimeter pistol at it and it wouldn't break it, or you could, it, it's bomb resistant on the inside. You know, the triple glazing has got 40 millimeter bank glass in it, as well as other things. You couldn't really lift a piece of it more than a meter square. So it, it's um, got two messages. One is that it's um, worldly, and the other is that it's defended. So both of those things are worth um, projecting into the world. And you probably notice that it has a particular shape, which is um, without being functionalist, when you're denying an embassy, there are certain spaces that can't go underneath other spaces because of um, security issues. And in fact, when we were building it, I arrived on site one day, and there were two, two men, two military men, quite short, standing like this. And I said, who are you? And they said, we're from the Department of Europe. And uh, we're here to um, make sure that all the reinforcing rods that go into the building really are reinforcing <laughs> rods. <laughs> so, and then they said, well, you know, the Russians drilled a, no Russians here, and the Russians drilled a 30 meter hole under the road to listen to the Brits. I mean, God knows why, since our government is so uninteresting right now, but that's another story. Um, but on, so let's say from that, and also from the fact that that an attic is, is beautiful as a form, um, then you get um, a terrace, which um, on one side it's for um, everybody working in the embassy, and the other is for the ambassador to talk to, talk to Saddam Hussein or people like those, Friends of Freedom like that. So embassy life is a curious thing. It's like a kind of theater of cruelty. But in front of all of that is a, is a place where, um, where dignitaries come. I mean, when you come into an embassy, you either arrive and go into a garage, which I'll show you, or if, you, if you're another ambassador or the Queen of England, you have to have some ceremonial space. And you know, my, I, my minimalism gave way to um, some maximalism here. This is the entrance. and by accident, when the doors open, Scotland goes in one direction and England in the other, but that's a kind of another thing. These things happen by chance, you know, in the back of your mind you somehow. But in, inside the space, there's, the ground floor has a, a place where you um, have trade events. And, um, and then the floor above is, is the workspace. And um, this facade, let me see if I can, no, wait a second. 
That's the facade we first looked at, but here is a, is a blast-proof garden. You, you know, it's interesting, the building regulations in uh, Warsaw are very strict because <coughs> there isn't a lot of daylight in the winter, so they want that you can't do what you can in the UK, have a 20-metre floor plate. It just, it's beyond building regulations, so you have lots of daylight, which makes it very quiet, very um, peaceful. And then if you come in by car, you go through a gatehouse, which I'm not illustrating, and your, your car is searched. And if you're, a, if you're an ambassador or somebody who's allowed to bring in a car, you, this door opens and you have a garage. But if you're um, a member of the public, like me, who in the past has had to go to your embassy in London and collect a visa standing in the street with my passport in a Tesco's bag. Uh, that's not something I want to do to other people. So um, this is a climb-proof glass fence. So if you're a visa person, you come and you see all of this stuff. You enjoy the embassy as much as anybody else. And then at the back is a consular visa entrance just for you, which is just as dignified as the one for the ambassadors. And here's another entrance hall in a completely different town. It's in Belgium, a town called Danza in Belgium. And um, we won this in competition. And there's this very interesting um, state of mind in um, European politics, provincial politics. This is a provincial town hall. And they are looking for um, procedural transparency and for making a town hall which is a public object. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. But So it's got two bits to it, two elements. It's got this building, which is for um, city officials to work, and then this, which is the debating chamber with offices underneath it. And both of them have a, a, a logiered facade. This is it just about works in... Um, keeping it low energy, you, it's, it's naturally ventilated. It's got tall ceilings, so you maintain um, working by daylight as much as possible, and you shade the facade with this loggia. And it, the buildings at the beginning, of the beginning of the town, you come across a bridge here, which is a bit difficult to see, but on one side is the church, and on the other side is the town hall, our town hall. So this, in its curious self way talks to that. These two buildings talk to each other, mainly through the fact that they're both made of stone. They just about talk to each other. I mean, this one's talking in medi medieval Flemish, and this, you know, this, and this one's talking in contemporary English. So and they, can't, they get along. And then on the, um, the other side, it, it's not just, um, it doesn't just talk to the grander buildings. It actually talks to all of this, because Cities are made with things like this. They're not always great. They're often made quite expediently. And so the um, simplicity of this building aims to um, talk to them, not to embarrass it, um, to be inclusive. And it's made of um, quite standard Flemish construction material. It's precast concrete. And then this is an Italian stone which is cast onto precast. And you can see it's um, very muted but actually has some dignity. And to go back to the issue of the loggias, this here is the loggia on the debating chamber. And both of these look over a river, which is um, rather wonderful. And these loggias aren't simply a technical device because actually this is how municipal workers in Belgium eat. They take food to work and they cook it in a large canteen and then they eat together. So it's very civilized. And they have views of the river too. So again, it's very inclusive. And the offices are good because this office, for example, on the corner has got, well, it has a balcony here and a balcony here. So most office spaces that you're working inadvertently are prisons. You sit in them all day and you can't go out. And this, uh, building. The loggias are a place where you could smoke a cigarette or have a private conversation or um, actually have a meeting. 
and they love it. They love this building. When my um, colleagues happen to go there, they're fantastically warm about it. And this is not a posed photograph. This, this is um, these uh, children were happened to be there when the photographer was there, and. We, when, when we were in the middle of designing it, there was an incident at a Flemish town hall where some politicians were attacked. And we said, look, we, we can provide security very discreetly. You know, through the embassy, we could provide it. You would hardly notice it. And they said, no, we want people to be able to walk everywhere because this building belongs to everybody in the city. So it's very, I mean, it's heartwarming to uh, work for people like that. And then this is the council chamber, but it's not just a council chamber. This is where people get married and they have ceremonies. So it's a real civic room. And it looks out to the city and the city looks back to it. And it's a possession of what the people have done so. And further along in Antwerp in Belgium, um, we just in the last year completed these two towers um, in an array of six towers, two by Dina and Dina, two by David Chipperfield, and two by us. And um, it's an interesting project because the developer, of the initial developer, was a very sophisticated Antwerp developer with great taste who ran out of money in the middle of it and had to sell the project. So. David Chipperfield's first building, which I'm, I'm not showing, which is over here, had, was rather opulent. And then the budget dropped. So he lost all of his balconies. And then when it came to us, it dropped to about here. And we said, so they said, uh, it was bought by a very good, but rather tough builder developer, who I, I like very much. I mean, in, in Belgium, if you go for lunch with a developer, it's um, they really eat, they can really eat, you know, and they're cultivated guys, and uh, so there's a pleasure. Um, but we said, they said, what do you want to make it from? And I said, well, concrete, like Professor Chipperfield. And they said, well, you can't. And we said, well, why can't we? And they said, because it's too expensive. So what can we use? And they said, brick. And I said, 16 floors high. I mean, it's not unusual here, but, and they said, yeah, we do it all the time. And so we built it in brick. So what do you do with two brick buildings? Well, if you make them effectively the same building, you make them look different. You know, this one's got a horizontal emphasis, and that one's got a vertical emphasis, which turned out to be um, the simplest idea ever and the most difficult thing to do, because um, if the bricks project, then they have to have a high frost resistance, and then the color of the brick gets darker and, you know. But I won't bore you with that. And also, when, that's right, the, um, originally we were gonna use a clay brick, which is uneven. And the contractor said, well, we're gonna glue the bricks together. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we had a, well, it's not irrational. I mean, it's called thin bed mortar because they couldn't point around all of the brick heads, you see. So we had a sample made in clay bricks and it looked awful, you know, so we, but anyway, I won't bore you with the story, we did it, we did it in the end, and it worked, and um, so this is part of an, a development, I'd say a development in the practice from making buildings which are large on detail and very considered, uh, which I still do, and I'll show you Anish Kapoor's house at the end, but to buildings for developers where you have to get potency in the image. And I, this doesn't connect really, but I'll say it. What interests me about Solowitz war drawings is that they come from a series of instructions which are given to other people. But that's where the difference ends. You know, with Solowitz, the, um, the Solowitz war drawings are carried out by people who badly want to work for Solowitz and are practicing artists. Whereas, in the building industry, you're working with people who go home at five o'clock and are not the same kind of people. So let's say by a process of induction between Sol DeWitt and me, um, I wanted to make a series of images that would um, be 
very simple and yet over time would be compelling and it's actually turned out that way and so what do you do well you keep the corners open otherwise you end up with a tower like David was compelled to make with the corners closed and then you open the top um, and the builder was the builder developer was some um, it's very funny about this he said um, we said the, the bricks above the window need to project and he said, but it'd be much easier if um, you had a coarser brick run underneath to support them, which is true. And I said, well, look, if it's to be architecture, it has to have at least one difficult detail. And they all rode with laughter, and then we went off to lunch, and that's how it went. But it's, it's um, animation comes from the fact that, depending on who's in, um, you get a different building. But there are important things to do. If you're doing something like this, you have to be very careful. For example, all the lighting on the balconies doesn't come from the soffit, which is standardly how you do it. It's lit from the balustrade. I mean, it's not easy. You probably need a, your, the torch to see your dinner if you're eating outside. But it means that you, you get these lit forms so that, and, and in the entrance. So, you know, if you can uh, steer the project in the right way, you can be simple. And um, it's, it's very charming. You know, we, when you're designing things, you've got these thoughts that don't really don't pan out in reality. We thought, what if people climbed up it? You know, I mean, they're not going to climb it. They'd need to be a gymnast to climb up it. So um, we, did, um, we did this, you see. Well, David, my partner, suggested this and then we looked at it and we said you know that scene in Star Trek where they all disappear it was a bit like that so we thought well okay let's leave it like that but it's got some dignity you know the landscaping is rather good it's by a French landscaper so it's very tasteful and then it has a portico this is white brick which is more expensive than red brick so we um, we can only use a bit of it and um, yeah it was like that and then but you have to get the entrance hall right. So what, what also is important about the open corners? Well, it means that somehow the appearance of the building works with the fragmented character of the view of the dockyard. Because this, this is Antwerp docks, which will change over time. And so, unlike the other buildings, which have a more immediate context, this doesn't have such an intimate relationship with buildings around it. it has a view over a changing city and it seems to me that a, a building like that or a corner like that is important but also you know you can see the fabric of the building so tactility is at work for you 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 know more of the building gives more of itself to you and then of course it embraces the view and it's comfortable it's not like a balcony where you're on view somehow you've got some discretion about being seen and seeing and just to amuse you, this is um, Roger Dina's scheme being struck by lightning while we're being spared. So um, I haven't shown this to Roger, so we're still friends. That's David's building, which has got the balconies. And then this is David's where the nose and ears were cut off because he didn't resist the developer. We said, they said, making corners open is very difficult. And we said, well, we're not going to change it. And then they said, good, and we did it. Um, this is in, um, we, what's very interesting is that unlike um, other architects, we um, are constantly working in the back of beyond, you know, like in Neuhausen and Rheinfall, which is an inconsequential city in Switzerland whose only claim to fame is this huge waterfall, an amazing waterfall, which is, um, a tourist attraction, you know, and I went to see it, and it's, and we're building up here, we'll be building up here. And I stood by it, and I said, can you turn it off? I mean, it was kind of fantastically impressive. So there's lots of double glazing in our scheme. Anyway, this is the situation, it's very typical. Swiss cities, to my surprise, don't really often have urban design. They're villages that have become towns. So. This is the location of our project, and it's, it's at a junction between a, a residential and um, shopping. 
and an industrial area. So it has these rather well-mannered Swiss factories, I mean, very elegant. And um, this new piazza is called Industry Platz, Industry Place. And so, well, what did we do? Well, we, this, this is important. This is a building which has south sunlight coming to the side of it. So we said, okay, look, we can make, we, we can make a form of a building which has got several parts to it, which exploits its relationship with this and leaves a hole at the back so the people behind don't get fed up with this and block our planning approval. And this is what it looks like. It's some, um, this is a kind of, you know you work in series when you, after you, if you have, when you start to have more work than normal, you start to work in series. This is a series on um, horizontality and verticality. I mean, I'm, it's about as simple as that, but this is, um, this was originally made of concrete, but it's now made of stucco. And it's got three parts. It's one building. It's got three parts. It's got this part that looks over the, the um, waterfall, this part that looks over the piazza south, south, and this bit that you, well, it speaks to the other side of the street. Well, it did. And then the minute that we got planning approval, somebody got planning approval for a 25-story building here. So we kind of lost that battle. Um, Cities change all the time, so you have to be a bit more astute, I guess, and romantic. But it's it's made of stucco with different um, types of stucco, uh, and uh, the apartments look over the piazza will have this view, and then those ones looking over the waterfall will have this view. So they'll be they'll be beautiful. They're very they're not expensive apartments. I mean this town doesn't support expensive apartments, so they're quite ordinary apartments. And so this was the beginning of uh, um, people in Switzerland being interested in this. And we were asked to um, compete in a competition for Swiss radio and television with two friends on the jury who said, this one is for you. Never believe it. It doesn't work out that way. No, they can't. You can't influence the jury. Juries make their own minds. So, Swiss radio and television, um, it's very interesting because they wanted a building which um, was very, very public on the ground floor. It has a big restaurant. And then they wanted all of this to show the working of the newsroom. You know, it's, newsrooms are very, very exciting. And then the computer's on the top. And we. Um, this was our all glass, first all glass building, and um, I'll show it to you. So you can, this is a view from the first floor, or to you, the second floor. Um, that's the ground floor, first floor. You, people come in here, and there's a new, like a constant, there's an amphitheater there where the news is constantly being played, and then above it is the room where they actually make the news. So you see the both parts of the process. And then up here is a huge, uh, was, would have been a huge canteen. You know, if you have, it would have been a canteen for the whole of the campus. This whole campus is about broadcasting. So, um, but unlike the front, which is like that, the back is like this. So it's got this deep cut in it facing south. And what you can see down here is a, a courtyard, public courtyard. So you come in through this rather imposing, iconic building, and then you find that actually it's, full of um, planting like this. And um, the offices are arranged around it. I'll show you a plan in a minute, but they're arranged around it. So you get lofts, reconfigurable lofts, but you have a sense, you can see your colleagues across the glass. And one thing that's important for me, when I look at office buildings in London, it's the upward view with endless amounts of um, fluorescent lighting and um, air conditioning grills, and I, I thought we could do better than that. So we demonstrated with the Swiss lighting engine that we could light on the desk and upward with a tiny bit of incidental lighting. We could um, put air in through the floor. So when you look up into this project, you only see lit ceilings, a bit like the corner balconies in the project in Antwerp. So this explains the layout. You, you have three wings of offices with WCs and lifts and all that kind of stuff. But in the middle, this was the thing that really interested me most, was a, 
an, an only gently heated outdoor space with a glass block floor, and it was where the cafe was. It was the coffee room, so that people would meet in that space informally, or they would work informally in that space. And then, going back down to the first floor, this is the restaurant, but we pinched it into shapes. We, we, that could be divided off, that could be divided off. So, if you, in these kinds of eating areas are used maybe twice a day, and then what you get is a huge space full of chairs and nobody in it. So we figured that we should make it more intimate. We also put a cafe here, opposite the newsroom, because this building was to be connected to the rest of the campus by these air bridges. So we thought, okay, let's say somebody wants to meet. Well, you let's say they would say, let's meet in the cafe that overlooks the newsroom and looks down to the public space. So we, in this building, although it's demonstrably flexible, it also is, um, it has a sense of place, which is what buildings should have. And then this is the entrance floor, that's a big outdoor courtyard, and the, that's the public restaurant. And so the staff come in and are seen by the public, and that's the news theatre. So it was a real um, melee of um, things happening. And this plan, the final plan, is to show you the pleasure that we hope that you would achieve. Uh, that area in the middle would have plants in it. This would have plants in it. So these hard-bitten newsmen would be, um, their lives would be made more tolerable by all of this, we thought. But we lost it to a Swiss project that looked almost exactly the same as ours, but slightly more Swiss, which is how it works. If you've got a public corporation, they're fantastically risk averse. You know, they, they understandably don't want to uh, take a risk with a, a foreign architect. So you, you have to understand that. But this, this was um, something we did some time ago in central Amsterdam. And the backstory to this is that for a long period of time, Dutch housing was all um, social housing. And it meant that people couldn't move, and they couldn't move up because it was a sort of Rubik's Cube of tenancies. And then the government, in this very Dutch way, decided they were going to create a, a market housing situation. So they released land for uh, development. And Amsterdam, in fact, owns, I'd say, about 90% of the land in the city, so it could do this. It also moderates the price of the land so that they can get experimental housing. And what that let happen is that the housing associations became um, developers, experimental developers, because they could borrow against their stock of housing, which was enormous. And they made a series of buildings like this. This is called Solid 11 in their parlance, and another version of it. They made three, one by Eble, Dietmar Eble, another by MVRDV and this one by us, and it's um, one of three buildings in central Amsterdam, and all of the three had to have pairs of buildings with a courtyard in the middle. And one of them down here is a psychiatric hospital, another is um, social housing, so it's completely rather wonderful and chaotic um, Dutch social mix. Um, but I was very interested, don't ask me why, I was very interested in um, uh, the buildings of Chicago at the turn of the century with their sobriety and yet their um, boldness and um, uh, the sort of strange things that happen in them and so that what one hopes is that as people cycle by this they'll see things developing, they'll develop their view of why this building is the way that it is. Um, and its courtyard in the middle is um, really a social space and it is true in Holland, nobody has curtains, so everybody can see each other. Um, <coughs> and there's a mix, there's um, a dentist, a uh, Polish dentist, and Carol, a hairdresser, who cuts hair in his living room. And then, then there are conventional apartments, which were, the, the fitting out of the apartments were by the, the tenants, so they're all very different. And um, what this shows is the generosity of these Windows, you know, if you if you don't know what's going to happen in a place, and you need to have fairly regular fenestration so that you know 
that people can put walls anywhere. Um, and so this is a glass balustrade. With it. So you open the doors and you have Amsterdam pours in through the window. And then this shows that you really are in a city. This is a really urban building. You know, this isn't for everybody. This is a place where only certain types of person who want to live in the city live by choice. So then uh, the rest of this is really housing, which is where we move to from art buildings. And this is um, in Amsterdam North. Now, Amsterdam North was no man's land in Holland. The, the Amsterdam that you would know is the rest is the south of the river, which had the canal plans and the canal houses. And the north was always some um, places where um, they hanged people or um, put people in prison and things like that. So it was never a place that people wanted to develop. But but there is a housing shortage in Amsterdam, and Amsterdam City is work, works on that. And this was a development with ING Bank um, of an area which had been um, the research um, terrain of Shell Petrol, um, which that's the last original tower. And so this this had two characteristics. First of all, it was on the water, which was very dramatic, and you got cruise ships, which are as tall as this building, passing by it. But it also had a kind of placelessness. And so what do you do there? Well, you aim for a, to make a building which somehow could be in Manhattan or could be in um, Brussels, a sort of ubiquitously um, placeless and yet um, rich building. and. We made these giant balconies, which were kind of cause celebre with um, glass block floors. And most apartments have got two of these giant balconies because Alvaro Caesar, built, Alvaro Caesar got the building in front of us because, you know, because he's Alvaro Caesar. So our building, you have balconies, you can look around Alvaro Caesar's building to see the river, you see. And so it's. Um, it starts with a, a format of um, gridded facades with two types of window. And then it's, uh, in a rather British way, it's played empirically. Wherever there's an opportunity for a view, a balcony occurs. So it gets a kind of irregularity in moments like this, and moments like that. But this is much, much more affordable in the center, in the west of Amsterdam. And so it's four identically planned buildings in different orientations. And when you get a, an urban design in Holland, you wonder what they were thinking about. You can't imagine why it was the way it was. And, um, and we said to the city who'd planned it, could we not do something a bit more? And they said, stop, just don't even think about it. So we made a building where you could stretch the apartments around the perimeter so they'd get a view and, and sunlight. And we also had to make a building which was the same format, but which looked good as a pair or looked good as a freestanding elevation. And this uh, eccentricity, let's say, that comes from adjustment and expediting the view gives that power to this building. And the entrance halls are also important in these buildings. You know, this, um, each of them has an identifying mark on the floor. So when you come home, it's not generic, it's real. It's a place you live in, and this is what it looks like. And this is on a fantastically low budget. And then in the north of Holland, in Den Helder, which is, that's a really interesting place. It's a, a naval town. And it had a big problem, which is that that its middle class people kept leaving. So it was a, a uniformly working class culture. It was poor. And the municipality um, asked a number of um, planners to plan um, alternatives. For, I think even you were, Stephen Hall was involved in that, I think. You weren't. Even Stephen Hall wasn't involved in this. The only building in Europe that he had no hand in is this building. Okay. Um, so the, 
they engaged a developer and they said, can you build a middle class housing? And uh, okay, we can do that. And this is, it was a, that's, um, you're in Hearst and that's me. We're wearing similar shoes, but I have a longer overcoat. He's, because he's Northern European, he doesn't feel the cold. I'm, you know, I'm from the South. Um, and we're not talking to each other, we're talking to our office. Um, but this is, the, there's, it's between, the site's between two canals. This is the smaller canal. And all of this was removed, as I'll show. But on the other side, there was a giant canal looking at, over a Napoleonic um, um, dockyard of some beauty, which had been restored. Um, I mean, in Holland, they do do these things to um, encourage business. You know, the municipality will spend money on um, fine buildings and will try to inculcate industry. So it has beautiful boats. And then opposite is, that's by Jeroen, that's by Jeroen Duan. What happens in Holland is um, you get an urban conceptualizer who um, is a sort of tyrant. You know, we had um, West 8 doing it. And um, so you say, couldn't we, couldn't we organize it a bit better? No, it has to be random, you know, so. Okay, you know, I mean, that's the nature of cities is if you think of Paris after Haussmann, some poor architect got the triangular site on the roundabout and did something brilliant with it. That's what you're doing in master plans. You're um, making sense of something that doesn't make sense. So here we are. What am I doing? Well, we, I, having had a love affair with um, Dutch canal housing for a long time, I thought I'd do one, you know, so it's some um, got good brickwork, generous windows, a tiny bit of stone. If you look at those Dutch canal houses, they're fantastically economical. And um, so that's what it looks like in, in the range, um, obliquely. And then at the, at the end, that's the dockyard that I just spoke about. And then at the end, there are these two, board, two build, tall buildings and a shop on the corner with a bit of stone embellishment. And then at the back, this row of houses which are um, two bedders for um, people in retirement, uh, people are starting a family. So it's very, uh, working in Holland is fantastically rewarding, I can't tell you. And then between those two rows of houses, there's, um, it captures the view of the town. So it's, it's situated and is part of the town without being too mimetic. Now this is a really strange project. This is um, a cafe restaurant in front of the Tower of London, replacing a 70s building with a, a, a um, GR, GRP diagrid roof, in which when we took it down, along Tower Bridge was some electrical wiring which we had tested and um, it turned out to be the alarm system for the Crown Jewel House. So we covered it back over. And um, how do you make a building like this? Well, there's two types of approach that we saw. One is evident in the ticket office further up, which is a high-tech building, which says, I have nothing to do with the Tower of London. That's the Tower of London, by the way. Um, I'm high-tech, and I'm part of the development over the road. And then there's another type of building, which is along the quayside which are a sort of garden huts which, from which you can buy food. And they're painted brown and they say, we don't exist, we, we, we're invisible. And I, being me, wanted to compose a building with the Tower of London. Well, I mean, you do it simply by using a natural material, which is wood, and then painting it to look the same as that. But other things like this is one of these upside down, you know, so, whoops. So, uh, and this is, uh, looks like a boathouse. So you, uh, when you do this kind of stuff, you have, um, it used to be called English heritage, but now it's called um, something like England with a, an exclamation mark. You know, governments go to any amount of expense to waste money. And um, so we, we sat with these people. They were very decent. I mean, they're academics. And um, well, in fact, the story was that, that the Tower of London thought it would be really clever 
to give the whole project, including the architecture, to the caterer, you see. You know, it's completely hands-free. Well, uh, so the caterer said, but we've never made a building before. So they arrived with this terrible scheme, and um, English Heritage said, oh, we're not having that. So they had a competition, and we won it. And then we met the caterer. It was like um, an arranged marriage, you know, we arrived and tore the veil away, and there we were. And um, then, the, then the caterer, at the middle of it, the caterer said, I can't do any of this. I'm just a chef. So in, um, historic royal palace, palaces, which is a quango, which is a British term. It means an unelected um, body that looks after. It's private, but it's kind of public. Um, said, um, we'll handle this. We'll, we'll hire you directly. So they did. And they said, would you like to do a would you like to gift shop for the, the Crown Jewel House? And we said, yeah, OK. Well, it didn't come off, but we, we got the job. And then we did this. So we, um, and it's, it's intended not just for tourists, it's actually intended for um, the hotels around there and the business people. So it sits on the edge of the moat. And from this view, it's, it's bigger than Renzo Piano's shard. But this is a perspectival effect. But it, sit, it sits on the moat. So it's romantic. You, you look out and you see the Tower of London, but also, unashamedly, cornerly, you look at um, Tower Bridge. And Tower Bridge is um, a fine example of Victorian ugliness. You know, they really spared no expense of, to make the world worse. And, and actually, um, kind of vigorous in a way. So. But you, there's nowhere on the key that, well, actually, look, this is one of those innocent buildings that doesn't exist. But um, there's nowhere on the key you can study this monster, so, but you can from our restaurant. And, um, and then the outdoor space, is these, this has retractable, retractable blinds, so you can extend the eating season, you see. So it has um, sunshade, but also waterproof, so that you can, you can eat outdoors. But, but actually, one thing that keeps happening in my work is that that this rhymes with that and it's interesting when I look at Caesar's work what I recognize in how he draws and then finally makes the buildings what I think architects of any caliber do is that they see things they see all the obvious things but actually in an area that they don't quite understand they notice things and it's in that noticing you get these kind of associational qualities that come from the building when you're focusing on doing it for other reasons. And Camden Arts Centre, well, this is, um, was originally a library. Um, I'll show you the model first. It was a, a local library built by subscription. So it was built between something like um, 1890 and 1920. And there are photographs of it half finished. And then it was taken over by an arts organization, Camden Arts Centre, very good, I mean, really incredibly good. They had an, Ad Reinhardt show there that was amazing. And, um, and they um, turned this public library into a series of art spaces themselves. And then eventually, they got some money to um, improve it. And we, we altered the insides. And then we put, on the front, we put an entrance here. Because originally, you had to go up these stairs. And you couldn't. The disabled access was impossible. So you, we provided a level of, well, it's staircase there and you come in through it there as I'll show and on the back <coughs> a cafe so this is um, what it's like so it's completely different and yet it it's tonally similar and it has certain alignments which fix it together and in a way what what I'm saying about this building is that um, it's it's uh, a building that other people have made and will continue to make so what we're doing is just one stage in this but when you come in you see the ceramic studio. Um, it's always what's been interesting about this building is that it's not just a, an exhibition space. It's a space where uh, the public learns to make things. And there are a number of artists that I know who had their first drawing lessons in this place. So it's hugely important. And when we got this project, a lot of people said, don't change it. Don't change it at all. So we had to change it. We had to change the galleries a little, but we kept them looking as they were, even though we put air conditioning into some of them. 
But in the, in the ground floor area, which nobody knew, we could do anything. So we drove this, drove this line of sight through from back to front to a cafe because the, the bookshop originally had been on the first floor, so their sales were very low. And these kinds of marginal organizations need to exploit every commercial advantage they can. So the bookshop's there, you can't, it's unavoidable. And then there's a cafe which they can draw the curtains, have artists' dinners in there and things like that. And that is that addition that I showed which composes with this. And then it's, it has a garden outside which, um, and this is much higher than the street. This is a London bus, a double-decker London bus. So from the top of the bus you see this garden and it's got a sign on there. So you have to constantly make people aware of this. Um, but this garden and the bookshop and the cafe provided um, those kinds of facilities in the place which was though it was wealthy and highly populous it had none of those things so this has become a venue outside its role as an art organization and this um, screen is an acoustic screen i mean partially acoustic from the road but it looks like this now and we worked with the well we worked with a group of artists a female collective of artists and architects called Muff, and they worked with the landscape, the, the gardener, not the landscape, but the gardener, Julie, who'd been caring for the garden. So it looks like this now. And these are the gallery spaces. Um, so for this one, we, when we got there, it, it, it's very noisy. You know, the road is very noisy. So we, and they'd very expediently put second, secondary glazing in and we took all that out and got all the windows refurbished and made them fit. So we got the same level of acoustic performance um, as before, but we, got, we restored the room to its more original um, uh, condition. And we, we, we lowered the lighting slightly. The artists wanted, we talked to the artists and they'd, who'd worked in the space over a long period of time and they were, small things that we did to make it better. We moved the escape door so that it was less evident and things like that. And then <coughs> in this gallery, it originally had light, roof lights like this, and we put them back in, but we put them in a different order, and we put acu acoustic absorbent in here, because if you have a big space like this <coughs> with guided parties, you need, first of all, you need voice intelligibility, but you also need to contain that sound so that other people who are just trying to um, see the art um, uh, have got some privacy too. And House for Two Artists, well, we came upon this scheme where two artists who originally painted houses for us eventually got money and then employed us, which was a rather wonderful reversal. And they bought this site in um, in Aldgate, and it had been, it's in the street, rather good street of um, Georgian houses, although this one's a reconstruction. But this building had been rebuilt in a very um, ungainly way, and we couldn't rip it down. So we, we uh, covered it with, um, I wonder if I can show you. Um, we used a red stucco, which was too red, and then one of the artists, the male of the pair, overpainted it, and black, so it's rather special. Um, and then, what were we doing? Well, we, we said that all of these windows would be um, metal on the inside and wood on the outside, and high performance. And that they would have some equivalence to these. You know, this is a modern version of that. And then, this alignment was important. These things are important, they're very small, but it means that this then becomes a figure of some significance, and then this railing has some uh, character which is similar to that window, and these have some scale of relationship to that, and then the ground floor is like a shop, but it isn't. And this is the section, so the facade we were looking at was here, and you, um, the, the back side is um, lower, and so this is, uh, there are two studios. Tim, who paints, is in the basement, and then Joe, his lady partner, um, who works with photography and um, uh, is up here where the light's very good. So this is Tim's studio and he, we said, how much light do you want? And he said, not a lot. And so this, is, this works well for him, you know. 
And then that's the kitchen that looks out into the street. And then their bedroom, the bathrooms facing the street so that the bedroom's quiet and it provides a buffer and these these are white glass windows and then there's a ventilator that opens up so you can line the bath and look at the street and then that's their bedroom. And then they care for their children so their children gravitate between the two studios and that's some um, Jana's studio on the top floor. And another housing project in, in London with a, a doctor's surgery and then um, duplexes and then a small apartment block. Um, and we used a, a very irregular brick, which we, again, we overpainted it black, so it had some color sim similarity to the surrounding area, which had brick that's got dirty. And um, it faces south over the street. Um, and that's the, a garden in front of the doctor's surgery. Um, and this is a section, so that's, that's the street elevation we were looking at, and this is the reverse side. So that's the doctor's surgery. And then that's a small apartment building, which is part of the development, but these are duplexes. So you come at, along here, along a walkway, and there's a, a courtyard, just, it's just got railings. And then that's northwest, and this is south. And you come in, and then there's two bedrooms. So that's the plan, so you, you that, courtyard is a sort of rudimentary device for, um, well, you can paint your bicycle or have a barbecue or all that kind of stuff. But it also means that you get some awareness of your neighbor. You know, you can park your bicycle and then you come in, there's the kitchen which opens in two directions and a living room and that's the south facing balcony. And then two bedrooms and two bathrooms above. And that's the walkway uh, and you look through. So at certain times when everything's open, you get a sense of how people live and how your neighbors are. And this, we're getting close to the end now. This is some um, housing for the same developer, a very small developer who um, called Baylight, who's a very charming guy. This is, um, this is, this is a house, garage, porch, balcony, window, window. And it's a tiny development with um, a bungalow at the end. Uh, and there's a view, the site slopes down, and there's a view over the South Downs towards the south. So these, this upper level, which is um, uh, can be a teenager's room, can be a granny flat, can be a studio, looks out over that. And then at the top of the development, there's a freestanding house which has got fantastic views over the South Downs and um, they look at each other you know if you can create the rudimentary rudiments of a society without being overbearing without forcing people in contact with each other but just giving them the space to look out of their kitchen window to the street but here there's a door which opens into this garden now these that tower element's like that, but actually the back bit's only a single story high. And the reason for that is that they're repeats and the south sun comes in like that. And so um, the facade, that's the garage, but the facade equivalent to that is blank. So you get a complete garden, which is private, but with a sideways view into the street. So again, all of these small moves let you either block them up or, or be uh, sociable. And this is the final project. It's um, for Anish Kapoor, and it's, um, is it a house? Well, it isn't really. Um, sites in Chelsea are in incredibly difficult to find. The Red House took a long time for the owner to find. And Anish had to buy the leases on um, an apartment building that I'm not gonna show, in order to get a very, very long ground floor. And so this is the, entrance to the apartment buildings. So that's the entrance to Anish's house and that's his garage. And it's very long. The only opportunity for light was either through the rear elevation or in the depth of the plan from, from above. So when you come in, that's the entrance door looking back. All of these surfaces are reflective, mildly reflective, so that you sustain the small amount of daylight you've got into the plan. And it's not unusual, it's what 
is done in um, Dutch canal houses. At the back of the room, you have a mirror. So you use lacquer and stainless steel. You might see there that that's, well, you can see it here. This is lacquer, and then the stone's slightly reflective. And then there's a, a an electrical lighting slot which s supports the light. So there's an illusion that carries you into seeing this courtyard here, which is a very confusing shot because it's got a Dan Graham sculpture in the middle of it. So that's a, a a star-shaped courtyard, um, and then you look into the living room. There's a stair that takes you up to the first floor of bedrooms. But we'll f we'll go through the the um, the living room um, to show you how it works. So that's the staircase I mentioned. There's a change of level. That's where you die, and that's where you live. Um, and then on the other side is um, uh, the other side. This is an Anish Kapoor sculpture, not a um, building failure, I'll have you know. And um, then you come to the end and there's a, a garden, which is now very, very overgrown and very beautiful. And the side of it is a corridor with a library in it, which takes you along past the garden to the bedroom at the back. And the bedroom, this is the parents' bedroom, the children's bedrooms are in the other block. And this is, um, like a little house, you know, it's configured as a little house. And then there's a stair that takes you down underneath the garden to the bathroom. This is what you have to get up to because London sites are always too small and too expensive. But if we come back here, we'll go back up, um, then you come to the top floor and there's a glass floor. The big, as I said, the big issue was to get light in. So. This is a glass floor that extends into a courtyard, as I'll show. That's the courtyard and that's the glass floor. So these top rooms are arranged around a courtyard. And um, uh, so there's children's bedrooms there and um, a family room here. And then the only elevation, in fact, is that. The end. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, in the first project you mentioned, you described how the client had gone through a big process of determining the rules, working with an architect to test out how those rules would play out. Yeah. And then you told us how you broke that rule right away by citing the building in a different area. So I guess my question is, how do you decide which rules to break and which rules to follow? You take a huge risk. And my business partner said, do you want to win this competition? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, don't do that. And I said, well, I think I have to. And they liked it. That's why we won. They said it was a modest statement. You know? And um, the other thing that we did is we had a rendering made which looked like an oil painting. So we won the watch on that one. You know, it's interesting how you win things. Um, what other questions have you got that I can answer? <laughs> so always have an oil painting and always break the right rule. Christian. Hey. So I, I was surprised what you presented and what you didn't present because uh, yeah. you talked a lot about views and about developers and about uh, yeah. how things uh, or, or how the project came together. But one can see in your architecture that there is a tremendous love for material and materiality, yeah. and uh, you almost avoided that topic to, to talk to us about that. It's I'm, true, it's I'm true. I'm wondering why. I, he, every designer has lacunae. When I first saw James Sterling talk about um, the uh, Cambridge Library, he described it as a function list, and we thought, what is this? You, you, he, and I saw Dan Graham talk, and he, um, I'd written about the pavilions that he made, which I find uh, um, fantastically interesting in that wherever they're placed, they seem to be in place. And I said, Dan, you know, you're, and Dan said, oh, that was my anthropological phase, and you couldn't get any sense out of him. So this is one of the problems of designers. Somehow there's certain things that we don't talk about. It's also rather British, you know, there's just this um, belief that somehow if you get the fundamentals right, everything else will be right. It's, it's, 
not different from tailoring or shoes. You know, it's, it's a ridiculously English problem that I have. But uh, well, I, you could draw me on this. I mean, I'm not being evasive, but I'm explaining the reality of. I, uh, as I came here, I thought, should I talk differently about the, the work? And I thought, but I, what can I possibly say? <laughs> So you could you could ask me a question and we could perhaps have a conversation about what what it, your your point was about the care of materials and well I choose them they they are chosen for visual strategic reasons but also and what I'll explain is that that when I made the building called the Listen Gallery there was a particular thing that happened and I I had been working in, in performance for a very short time I you know, maybe six months. And I worked with a performance group. And what struck me about their work was that they were using almost exactly the same things that an architect used or engaged with their people, places, articles of use, rooms. But they were um, uh, able to see the social and political values in those objects. And when I came to design the Listen Gallery, suddenly all of those elements of the building stopped being simply decorative and, and I could see them as being charged, politically charged, but of course you know, when I think about it, I, uh, it's not innocent I think about how they look and, but the aesthetic is um, very much in combination with these other ambitions I mean I, I did a crit in um, Belfast and the students there were very interesting because they spoke almost exclusively about the aesthetic qualities of their buildings. And I hadn't heard that before. And Irish architecture is quite different from British architecture in that it's concerned with um, real architectural issues, you know. But I find that rather difficult to do. I, I'm hesitant to make purely formal statements. I mean, I've got a lot better. I didn't used to be able to do any of it, but it always had to happen inadvertently. But but in, when I was doing the towers in Antwerp, I, I kind of knew what I thought it would look like. But it, I suppose I'm very resistant to architecture, which is, which is only aesthetic or is highly aesthetic. Because I, I think, I mean, I'm political in spirit, not, I mean, I'm not Highly, I'm a social democrat, so I'm not. People from the left would discount me. Um, but as a as an architect, I, I'm interested in how um, you could make you could make a communicative architecture. So aesthetics is part of that uh, of that desire, um, and a very important part. I mean, the red stone of the red house was chosen because I wanted to make something which was opulent, but was wouldn't would work with the surroundings, which was red brick. But, you know, having spent time in Holland, where every building shouted, you know, I just I don't I can't bear it. I just don't want to do that. So I wanted to do lots of things at the same time, including make beauty, which is fantastically important to me. But it's one part of a, a wider enterprise. Does that go some way to? Uh, but I can do it. I can you know, do beautiful stuff too. In your early career, I think I read that you said you worked, you were in a dialogue with quite a few other London architects and talking about what London architecture could be. And I was wondering, was this a dialogue that was very helpful to you in developing what your work was? And were you able to continue with that, or did well, your career become more isolated? Bill, actually, what happened is that without being immodest, that when I made the Listen Gallery, it changed everything for the subsequent generation, like um, Cruz Isingen and Sergis and Bates, who say that, that the sensibility that I opened up in the way that I described it to Christian gave a basis for making a completely different type of architecture. Because David Chipperford, for example, who I respect very much, was making um, shops for um, Izzy Miyake, and very beautiful they were. but. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this more uh, political architecture in a way. And, and so I, without any 
fear of contradiction, I started all of that. And two generations of architects have been working, if they have that sensibility, they're, they're working. So we we did, in the beginning, we did start a writing group called um, Papers on Architecture, but it, for a number of reasons it fell apart. And the interesting thing is that almost everybody who's participated in that went on to leave the UK and become, or, or became um, professors in European universities and wrote. So it did stimulate that, but it didn't, it, we couldn't realize it in the UK for lots of reasons. You know, I think an interesting thing is what uh, leads to a culture of architecture because, uh, um, you know, I, I think that as at this very moment there's a much stronger culture of architecture in Ireland than there is in England. And it, it, I find it interesting how when you end the lecture, you know, you return to England in a way and you, you move away from the, the, uh, the possibilities of larger scale development and the possibilities for civic work, you know, which I think, uh, you know, for me, uh, what you've achieved, you know, uh, the best of what you've achieved is this civic work and uh, this large scale development. And it's very noticeable that when you return to the English uh, scene, everything drops down, you know, not only the scale, but also the quality of the material in a way. But can the, the, the you know, the, 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 those schemes are not in sequence, they're um, associative. I mean, Anish has yeah. occurred in a different sequence, so the project in Dainta came later um, than Anish's. No, but it's not just the time, it's got to do with the place, the don't you think? It isn't a question of the time sequence, it's got to do with the, the climate of the country and the, you know, I, I just think that the, if you compare uh, the British scene and the Irish scene, for example, it seems to me the Irish scene in general is much stronger today than the British scene in terms of architectural culture. It's true, uh, but, although know. Irish architects have uh, quite a lot of difficulty in, in getting the scale of work that suits their talents. But you know Rietveld, who was, uh, we know, was an architect, a designer of considerable international reach, um, made, um, large buildings, but a lot of his career consisted of making individual houses for people of modest means. And I reviewed a book of his houses, and they were the range was from um, kind of uninteresting to brilliantly interesting. And there's nothing wrong in uh, practice that work operates at different scales because that's how the work comes. You know, you have to just accept that that's how it is. We pitch for. Um, civic jobs, some we get, some we don't, you know, and you do other things as well. You but it's significant that the civic jobs are not in in the UK. You know, that's, well, that's no, There is civic work, but the, the way that you get them is, um, it, it's rather confined, and we always win those projects on design and then lose them on fees, you know, because the way that civic buildings are procured, to use a horrible word, in the UK is, um, the central government has put local authorities, municipalities under such financial pressure that they have to sell their land in order to build new civic elements and that means they have to engage with developers and that means that they're cost conscious and then they have <coughs> review boards that don't let them permeate architects purely on the basis of design. So it's practices that, that, that work in that field are very, very skillful at pitching their fees right. And um, But it's it's harder to build civic work in um, the UK. And in Europe, there's greater funding. Yeah. You know, in Belgium, they want to build civic buildings and they provide adequate amounts of money for it. So, yeah, um, I think that, you know what, what happened in the British case is this uh, concentration of power in London and the, you know, the neoliberal politics destroyed all the the fiscal basis of uh, municipalities throughout the country. Well, it changed it dramatically, and as I say, local authorities have to um, yeah. extract money in any way that they can, and in order to do that, they have to be, um, they're under surveillance in a way for 
costs. You just have to accept that. I mean, a lot of um, and the, when you were working in the UK, a lot of social housing was incredibly low budget, but people managed to do things within it, and some you win, some you lose. You know, when we the housing that we did for that smaller developer, he's received much more elastic with money because he wanted to experiment. So it's a tough business to run. You know, you kind of do what you can do, and you do it as well as you can. You make something of it. And that's what differentiates our work, that nothing leaves the office until it's interesting. You know, we make every project interesting. None of it's just run of the mill. First of all, I think it's very refreshing to see this work and the, in the context of this particular institution and how things are described here, let's say. Um, but I'm very, I mean, it's also very difficult to penetrate um, some of the thought. Uh, I, th I think it's rather guarded. And I, I'm just, I have a simple question. So is, the sequence of the lecture was obviously thought out very carefully, but it's hard to go beyond the notion that somehow you zoomed in on detail and ultimately into a very elaborate, um, you know, re renovation design. Uh, can you say more about how, how you put this together? And what, this lecture? Yeah, and, and how does it lead to a future, let's say, in your thought about, about architecture and where you're going? Um, you know, I, I'm, well, I put the lecture together so that there's some contrast of scales. You know, you try not to have too many of the same type of project. Um, um, yet, there's value in continuity. So you do it almost like a designer. You look at it and you think, um, how will it engage an audience, basically? So it's not, it's not in time sequence. Um, the lecturing doesn't really influence my thinking about architecture. My thinking about architecture occurs by looking at buildings, like the things we're looking at with the students in um, the UK, looking at Louis Kahn again, um, and your attitude to architecture and the way that you want to do it changes as you build things. You accumulate a set of capabilities, and you think, how can I... Um, what can I do next? And you look actually for the project that will give you the possibility of an imaginative leap. Does that answer your question? No, that's good. I mean, do uh, you find that the, the context of teaching design is, has changed, or the constants? But then I caught, I caught uh, one little phrase. Uh -huh. At the very beginning, which was, was it? the irony and pain of postmodernism. <laughs> so you obviously, you'd like that. we've been in the same place. You know. yeah. <laughs> well, the, um, but of course, students change. You know, their, their formation is different. But um, it seems to me that there's a certain style of humanistic thought that, that's existed in all students that I've taught for the last 40 years. You know, they are interested in fundamentally the same thing. You would have thought that maybe they would all become rabidly concerned with their career, but it doesn't seem so. You know, they are social beings, and um, that's very comforting, I must admit. Um, but let's talk about postmodernism. I saw something very interesting. There's a, a a young Swiss practice called Luchens Padmadaban, who you probably haven't heard of, but <coughs> they've re-engaged with um, Venturi's book, Complexity and Contradiction, and they're, in, they're interpreting it in a fantastically intelligent way, very scrupulously. They're saying that they're, they, they're not doing what, what I see Venturi, Venturi doing, kind of going off to service the American establishment and um, they're, they're much, you know, they're taking its intelligence very seriously and they're very serious guys. So their, their work is 
quite new and it will take some time, but they're going to be really interesting. Yeah. I went to the van of it, we went to the van of Anturi house and I was astonished by how inept it was. It's incredible. No, really, really bad piece of work, I'm afraid. <laughs> and, um, yes. And how does he get such airplay? You know, it's, well, that's another thing, you know, like you, you wonder why, how buildings get built, you realize the clients are on the kind of other planet sometimes, you know, it happens. But, um, I mean, I read Complexity on Contradiction and was um, very affected by it. And I'm gonna have to read it again, I think. I'm gonna have to read it very carefully again. It it was a completely enlightening book, but why they went off the way they did, I I really don't know. They were so punk when they started, you know. It was really interesting, and then suddenly it wasn't. So there, I mean, there is considerable interest amongst um, generation of architects, perhaps in their early forties, and people like Sterling, who I I just you know I I don't get it, but. Um, I think some some of them are interested in the sort of vulgar version of postmodernism, and some, like uh, Lutyens Padmanabhan, are, are interested in the intelligence of postmodernism. And actually, in the Red House, when when it first was published, critics asked if it was a postmodern building, but it it wasn't. And my argument is that it's a building of its time that can avail itself of, of different types of architecture, which still have utility in the present time. Um, for those of, us, those of us who have tried to achieve such a um, pure level of aesthetic expression, uh, mm -hmm. we know that it's rather complex today to, uh, to deal with everything we need to hide, mm -hmm. including insulation, mm -hmm. uh, mechanical services, etc. Uh, so, especially in, in Europe where insulation is kind of mandatory, <clears throat> um, dressing becomes uh, something that's very uh, prominent and I suppose that most of the works that you've shown us uh, have um, you probably spend a lot of time designing the wall section yeah and yeah. what you've shown us is probably only one very small aspect of your entire uh, design of the wall so can you say something about the, the your attitude or your approach to the to dressing today when the wall sections become more and more, um, they, they hide more and more in, in effect. Well, we should do it. And actually what shocked me when I was at Delft was I began with my chair saying we would have the greenest architecture in the department and I couldn't get anybody to teach it. Um, they have endless chairs of building construction but they don't teach it. And really the the question is how can it be absorbed into the general practice of architecture, which isn't simply about techniques, it's about um, the experience of buildings and its civic messages. And that's a completely fascinating project and it's one that I don't explore enough in my work you know, to, um, to make it nearly self-sufficient. But that's really what one should be doing, I think. It's not a good answer, but it's what we should be doing. I think we should be bringing the event to an end. Yeah. So I want to Please. thank you once again Bloody for a very up. stimulating <laughs> <laughs>